my name is Maddie and I'm a second year creative producing student at East 15 Acting School in South End. I've lived here most of my life and absolutely love history. My two friends, Serena and Eli, are not originally from this area, but they were keen to find out more. So I sent them on a quest to find out interesting things about South End and the surrounding areas, and thus Peering Back was born. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll each be bringing a topic to the metaphorical table to discuss and find out something new and hopefully interesting. So, what have you been looking at this week, Serena? I've been looking at the Essex Witches and just looking into various things online. Come across over 760 Essex women and men accused of being or consorting with witches. In fact, one website, I found 766 names listed of people accused of witchcraft between 1560 and 1675. That's Whoa. not long to have that many names. No. No, just, just over like a, 100 years. That's like weekly. <laughs> that's just mental. Yeah, and it's just one of those things that many were found not guilty. Others were just hanged or just died in prison. So again, it's quite an interesting thing back in the witch trials. There was quite a lot happening in Essex, in and around sort of Old Lee and South End itself. So we have the pub over in Old Lee. Is it the Sarah Moore? The Sarah Moore pub, that's mm. the one. Yes, I know the one. So, and in fact, while I was Googling on all these lists and things that kept coming up from the search engine, um, I didn't find Sarah Moore's name, but I found three other local women trials in the area. And it was Joan Allen in 1574, Alice Souls, 1622, and Joan Roll, 1645. They were all women that lost their lives. It's interesting to note that many of the witches, because it's hard to think of witches anything other than females. And when you're looking at sort of Halloween times and all the portrayals of witches, they're always women. Mm. But witchcraft in itself is a crime that was committed by men and women. And even in the Salem witch trials, out of the 19 witches hanged, 14 were women. So again, it does seem one of those things that women do seem to come off the worst for this sort of crime. Yeah. Uh, so again, there was one witch I found an Essex woman who was hanged for witchcraft could finally receive a public pardon 370 years after her death. And that was about <laughs> Anne West. Yep. Is that too little too late? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Anne West, she lived in Lawford near Colchester. Okay. She was, yep, she was executed in 1645 during a very busy time for witch trials in Essex. And her own daughter even branded her a witch. <gasps> That's wow. shocking. Yeah, and, and the crime in itself is even more shocking when you think that somebody was hanged for a stare which allegedly killed an unborn child. So the crime was a stare and the person miscarried a baby and so Anne West was then branded a witch for causing the loss of the child, testified against her mother. Um, that, I mean, that's just all just built on ridiculousness because that mm -hmm. can never happen. And it's just mad that they <laughs> believe that that genuinely could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's well, just a way for um, them to push blame. Yeah. Yeah. An American born writer, Sarah Pascoe, in 2015, actually raised a petition to pardon Anne West with the support of the South End. MP. So again, it's one of those things that even though it's sort of gone back into the past, it's about history, finding justice. It's one of those weird facts that was found in just a generic search that when you start digging, suddenly everything disappears. And it, it could be the magic of witchcraft. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But there were 14 other witches hanged at the same time as Anne West. And again, trying to find all those names and details about them. Uh, it's like long sketchy. since got, been gone. Yeah, it's, it's very sketchy. Mm. But there is a, a pond over in Old Lee, um, which is known as the Doom Pond, where the witch trials happened back in the mm. mid 1600s. So, again, that is a, a little story in itself. It's said to be the traditional ducking pond for witches. So if you were branded a witch, they would duck you in a pond. There's all sorts of ghostly sightings around there that have popped up on the internet because that pond is 
thought to be bottomless. And um, yeah, it makes me want to just go in and yeah. <laughs> so a pottery was built close to the pond, and um, they had a great big doom kiln that stood beside the pond. So again, that could be another reason why it was called the Doom Pond, not just because of the witches. Mm. Hmm. It's just so tragic, isn't wow. it? That so many people lost their lives on superstitions and crazy beliefs. Yeah. What I was looking into was uh, Canvey Island and sort of the history of the surrounding area of Canvey. It's pretty cool. In fact, it was actually described by uh, Ptolemy, the Alexandrian, like the Greek mathematician, astro- you know, like the guy who wrote the first Geographia, uh, <laughs> like the first map and uh, about stuff. And he described Canvey Island. I know, right? Which is pretty crazy. At the time, he called it Kaunas Island, because basically the origin of Canvey, as its name, might come from a couple different areas. Kaunas Island is the suspected idea of where it came from, because eventually Kaunas changed into Canvey, basically. Is like, in cow, is in the animal? No, as in C-O-U-N-U-S. So oh. they think it might be because it comes from the Anglo-Saxon word Kaninje, Kaninjage, which is, means like the island of Canna's people and there therefore it turned into Canave uh, and then oh, okay. eventually but another idea of where it came from is the fact that Boudicca who led a Celtic rebellion against the Romans in the area actually met there on the mud banks with the Trinovants, Cantiasi, Catavolani, sort of like different Celtic tribes and therefore it was the council island. So oh, that island, is so cool! Right? So can the island might actually be from Boudicca's Rebellion, where Boudicca sought counsel. Well, they didn't teach about that in school. Right? <laughs> there's, also some, there's also some cool things about, so, like, there's been Roman settlements there since, like, 50 AD. In fact, they found pottery there that's dated back thousands of years, as well as large things that they call Red Mounds, which is a Essex-specific Roman archaeological site, which is basically a giant red hill that's created when they sift through the silt for usable pottery and bronze so it remains as this giant pile of red clay after they create a bunch of pottery which is pretty amazing because you can still go there and see these huge red hills which are now covered in grass but if you dig into the soil they're bright red whoa Mm -hmm. later on it got sort of recorded later it was owned by a norman english landholder for a while but sort of like going into the more modern era canby actually had some interesting history in terms of the Dutch. So basically, during Edward II, so this is like the 1300s, there's a guy named John D. Apeton, who later his last name got turned into Appleton, so that's where that last name comes from. Oh, uh, there's, there's Appleton School right by there. That makes exactly. Sense. Appleton, okay. Appleton, which turned into Appleton in British English, which oh. turned into Appleton, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and basically, he had this huge flock of sheep on the land for like their family had it for like 300 years but the island was prone to flooding so what they did was they brought over 300 dutch engineers to construct seawalls along the entirety of canby island to stop the floods and basically you can still find the octagonal dutch cottages from the 17th century that is still preserved on the island and now function as a museum there in fact if you go down to the coast at the water side on canby island you can still see the old wooden foundations rotting away canby island as we know it is actually reclaimed land in much the same way as the Netherlands is, which is pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. Basically, for exchange for building the seawall, the Dutch engineers got a third of the land of Canby that they created. And they created, I think, over 15 square kilometers of land from the Thames, which is pretty amazing. Wow. Um, yeah, I know, right? And basically, they uh, because they settled there and they got so much of the land, a lot of the street names there are still Dutch to this day. Well, that makes so much sense, but I never realised that there was a Dutch connection. Did you, mm-hmm. Serena? No idea at all. Although, you know, if you're going to ask anybody to pull you out of the sea, it would be the Dutch because they are infamous <laughs> for reclaiming back the land um, for their country. So, Amongst those Dutch names, interestingly, later on at 1800s or so, you know, what's considered the modern era here, <laughs> uh, which is pretty crazy considering that's like the beginning of my country. But... Uh... <laughs> 
In the 1800s, there was a Londoner who basically bought up a bunch of land and tried to create a property development. And he sold large parts of Candy as Ye Old Dutchman's Island and basically renamed a bunch of streets to be Dutch as well. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, later on, that it ended up flooding, and basically the whole development was destroyed. Yeah, like hundreds of people died during that. It was a huge deal at the time in the 1800s, and there was actually a pub called the Lobster Smack Inn. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, during the Black Monday floods, the pub was renamed. The waters came up and basically stopped right at this pub's door. They renamed it the Knut Inn after British Danish kings in like, you know, like 1020 or something like that. He was named King Knut, and he was famous for the fact that he just went to the water in Denmark and said, Stop! And the water stopped at his feet. <laughs> Was yours on Friday? Mine was on the Curzel, and it was actually really, really famous. Turn of the century, it was a really, really popular place for people to come for day trips or weekend trips, usually from London, because obviously the Victorian era brought steam trains, so it was quite an easy trip with. <laughs> Lots of B&Bs and stuff in the area. And it was opened in 1901 and it's now a grade two listed building. <laughs> Doesn't it have a Tesco in it? <laughs> it? It does now, yeah. <laughs> it does now. And, Is that um, the only grade two listed Tesco? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not, sure, <laughs> I'm not sure if there are any others. <laughs> I'll do a little Google search and find out. There was, I don't know if there still is, but at least there was a McDonald's there as well. <laughs> so a grade two list of McDonald's as well. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and it was actually one of the world's first purpose-built amusement parks because it was actually more than just the building of the Curzel. They had quite a large area of land where they had water chutes and roller coasters. And it was actually the largest fairground in the south of England by quite a long way, I think. At one point it had a circus in it and they had tigers and wolves and bears, which is unimaginable now yeah. considering well yeah it's very different <laughs> from then but it was really really popular especially in the 50s and 60s holidaying in British seaside towns was still most people's form of holiday so South End was super popular but in the 70s with cheap package holidays coming onto the scene it drove a lot of people onto warmer climates <laughs> In 1973, it actually closed down and they they sold off a lot of the land and a lot of it became what is now the Curzel Estate, the housing estate, which is sort of around the back. But there used to be a ballroom, an arcade, a billiard room and a massive dining hall. Wow. And you can sort of see it yeah. because you won't have gone inside, Eli, but when I was younger, I remember going and playing bowling in there and a lot of people had birthday parties and stuff in there. And it was such a massive building hardly any of it was actually used a lot of it was just shut off to the public but yeah it was reopened in 1998 uh, one thing that did make me laugh when i was having a little look was that the new owner reveals on uh, his grand opening ceremony that nine skips full of pigeon droppings had to be removed from the dome alone wow because it oh, just wow. sat there for for the better part of 20 years so <laughs> that, wow. that made me chuckle that's um, amazing <laughs> but going back in time in its heyday around the 50s they were largely self-supporting they had their own greenhouses and grew their own produce they had a large in-house laundry room for the dining halls all the tablecloths and serviettes and stuff would be washed in-house and they also had their own ice cream and rock factories on oh site. my god yeah wow. which i never ever realized and the water chute that was dismantled in 1971 was moved to Ocean Beach Amusement Park in Real, where it actually still stands and functions today. Huh. You'd think oh with all its health and yeah. safety, it would have been <laughs> removed. Wow, yeah, yeah that's funny. <laughs> But, um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about South End being a place where people visited and was very popular in the 1970s. Mm. Um, and again, you know, I can remember as a little girl, South End was a good day trip out and it was quite a buzzing seafront in those days. But this was kind of cool. Um, it's actually been used as the set for a few TV series and films. For the series, a, a couple of them were The Avengers, The Prisoner, Nearest and Dearest, and oh, film. Oh, wow 
was over the moon and 21 days. Oh. It's quite cool to know that that's in my hometown and it's been featured quite a lot, actually. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> I have left the best until last, though. Yeah. And this blew my mind and I think it might blow yours too. So after it closed in the 70s, it actually became a rock music venue. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> And there were quite a few rather well-known bands who came and visited us, including Black Sabbath, wow. Purple, <gasps> Thin Lizzy, <laughs> Queen, <laughs> and ACDC. And their album art for um, the album Let There Be Rock is a picture of them performing at the Curzel. That's wow. crazy. That's so weird. How many? is that yeah it makes me want to go film there <laughs> <laughs> well good luck because it has been closed as Serena said for a little while a tes- yeah it's a Tesco now <laughs> <laughs> well no Tesco only makes up a small part of it but the actual indoor space is massive all of this was recorded on zoom so apologies for the mic quality but thanks for listening and join us next week to find out what else we discover about Southend <laughs> <laughs>